Hi there, nice to meet you. I'm Dr. JC Lowen, this is Dr. Alina Fong, and we are here to talk about the ketogenic diet and headache relief and whether there's a connection. So we wanted to do something a little different um, rather than being stiff and standing in front of you. Um, we wanted to have this be a bit more in, uh, interactive with us, you know, considering this is the first time we've seen people outside of our home uh, for a, a few weeks. Um, and yes, we are being very COVID-minded. Uh, we've been in isolation and um, no symptoms, no fevers, mm -hmm. and we have bathed in Purell. <laughs> so we are ready to go. Okay, awesome. So to quickly walk through some acronyms, um, I'll just start off with the first couple. Functional MRI is a type of imaging that we're going to discuss a little bit later, but it is shortened to fMRI. Um, PCS are post-concussion symptoms. So these are symptoms that can be either acute after concussion or become chronic. So people can start presenting with them for long periods of time. Uh, NVC is neurovascular coupling. So this is kind of the metabolism of how the brain works. Uh, PTH is post-traumatic headaches. Also can be called chronic or persistent PTH. Um, the next are just mild traumatic brain injury. You're probably very familiar with that term. KD is ketogenic diet and KB are ketone bodies. Okay. So briefly, what we want to cover in this time with you is an overview of PTH and the PCS patient, understand the main theories behind PTH, ketogenics 101, um, and then going over the molecular bases of KD to understanding and understanding the um, NVC implications, the physiologic basis of chronic PTH and migraines, and further research and future directions. Uh, and aren't you glad you had that acronym <laughs> slide before then? Okay, so I'm going to take, I'm going to let Dr. Fong take the primary kind of lead on the first part with, you know, headache, TBI, etc. Um, but as we're talking through, I may put kind of a research spin on some things, again, kind of making this more of a friendly conversation, mm -hmm. but go for it. <laughs> So um, for those of us who have treated concussion patients, we all know that headache is a big issue. Uh, in some studies, it'll say anywhere from 30 to 90%. I think in our clinic, JC, wouldn't you say it's more like 95 mm -hmm. plus 95. percent? Yeah. Um, yeah anyway, uh, it's, it's almost the most common symptom. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the harder ones, I feel, uh, for us to deal with just because it can be so multifactorial. Mm -hmm. Um, we tend to see patients that are more in the chronic stages. So we don't see as many of the acute. We see more of these more chronic, persistent headaches. And often these patients have been experiencing their headaches for years mm -hmm. after their concussion. Uh, and so if it's a concussion that's after a TBI, that's what we call a PTH or post-traumatic headache. So what are exactly post-traumatic headaches? Well, uh, it's a headache that usually occurs within seven days of the injury uh, or after regaining consciousness. Uh, it, not always though, uh, but it can be associated with other types of uh, post-concussion symptoms, including dizziness, uh, insomnia, cognitive issues like memory mm -hmm. concentration, um, phonophobia or um, photophobia, so sensitivity to light and noise, um, fatigue, mm -hmm. it's a hard one. Yeah. Um, Mood it's a, changes. It's a multifactorial one because it makes sense that if you're in pain, you're going to have some of these symptoms. I mean, all of us have probably experienced some type of, you know, headache that you're going to feel other effects with it. Um, I think the important, you know, the piece here is that, as Dr. Fong said, how long these patients are dealing with this and that vicious cycle um, that comes with it. And interesting, and in, in, interestingly enough. These PTH, these post-traumatic headaches, are more commonly associated with concussions rather than the more severe and moderate brain injuries. Um, the most common types of chronic PTH, and we're gonna go over it in more detail, is uh, we call cervicogenic or um, tension type headaches, and then migraines. Okay, so those are the two main ones that we're going to cover. But other rare types are also occipital neuralgia and supraorbital neuralgias as well. Um, this more chronic tension type headache is, is more common in these concussions. We're talking these kind of chronic, mm -hmm. dull mm -hmm. aches or just yeah. always pulling, kind of at the back of the neck. 
Yeah, and uh, rather than these kind of quick episodic kind of te- oh I just slept wrong, mm-hmm. you know, um, those are usually more easy for us, easier for us to piece apart. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just very complex, and there are different risk factors for these different types of PTH and different presentations too. Mm-hmm. And what's really interesting about the types of presentations is that I have never seen a patient have one like it's not usual for them just to have one type of headache. You know, not just a sinus headache, not just an ocular migraine. These can present together. They can present. Many of our patients are just. I'll ask them, what kind of headache do you have? And they're like. Well, I've got six different types. Let me walk you through. Um, And some of the mechanisms of these headaches are similar, and Dr. Fong will will walk through some of these. Um, But I think the main point is that it makes it so hard to diagnose, and it makes it so hard to treat. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about migranists first off. So these are characterized by what we call paroxysmal attacks. They're unilateral, they're severe, they can pulsating, throbbing, um, and they're usually associated with that light and noise sensitivity and also nausea and vomiting. Um, it can be provoked by uh, bright lights, um, stress, not getting enough water, mm-hmm. sleep issues, even foods. Uh, but what can be so debilitating about these migraineous headaches is that they can last anywhere from f- a few days, I'm sorry, from a few hours to a few days mm-hmm. to be in this type of debilitating pain. And we'll go into the kind of the mechanisms later in the ketogenic uh, version, um, but that four hours to 72 hours is just the headache part. We're gonna talk about that may not be the whole story behind migraine. So the next type, which is a bit more common that we see, is what we call cervicogenic headaches. Um, Very rarely do we see a concussion that didn't have some type of a a motion or a neck issue with it. Um, And so these are usually more mild to moderate in intensity. They don't have that unilateral um, pulsating headache. It's more of like a, just kind of an ache. Um, And usually, and and it responds to, to massage, it can respond to stretching, mm-hmm. um, and uh, usually um, range of motion can be affected mm-hmm. with these types of headaches uh, as well. Um, some neck spasming. Because cervicogenic headaches and, and neck issues are so part and parcel with concussions, in our clinic we always do a cervical scan mm-hmm. as well because we'll often catch herniated discs or um, you know reversal of, of the, the, the cervical curvature, spasming that we see that, that is uh, often the culprit of these cervicogenic headaches. I always find it incredible the fact that your musculature can pull so much as to change the actual curve of your spine. I've seen patients with swan neck deformities that have been caused by not only light sensitivity because they're naturally looking down more, but because of that muscle tension. And think about all of the arteries, mm-hmm. the just the vessels of your neck. Um, it, it's I, I can't believe that some of these patients go years without a cervical spine, just telling them what's going on. Yeah. Uh, I have a patient um, that we're going to be bringing up in a little bit um, that is 33 years old, been struggling for about 15 years, and never has had a cervical uh, MRI. Mm-hmm. And female. And female. Uh, we have smaller, <laughs> females have smaller neck muscles, they're not as strong, and so we're more prone to issues with our cervical spine. So those are the two main types that we're going to be talking about, but there are also some other types that can make diagnosing this and treating this complicated. Uh, so we have headaches due to hypertension, um, due to um, ocular migraines, so more ocular issues, mm-hmm. <sighs> sinus. <laughs> it's okay, so just to take a step yeah. back, it's something that um, we've noticed in our clinic, and we're going to talk about the possible cause of this actually in the next slide, but with increased pressure in the head um, due, you know, due to multiple changes in the body, we have many patients that report more sinus headaches or more sinus pressure after their injury. Uh, so that's the reason we put it on this slide is because it's something we notice more commonly. Well, and we also... Uh, Each patient not only does a cervical, but they also do a structural MRI of the brain. And I can't tell you how often we see sinusitis picked up. Yeah, yeah, inflammation in the nose itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, In addition to a functional MRI, which we'll talk about uh, as well. Okay, so the autonomic nervous system is this kind of sneaking little culprit or thief with these uh, with these headaches uh, because and we're finding that there's a subset of these headaches that are due to autonomic nervous system dysregulation. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so when there's a, a concussion or an injury, it can often result in damage to uh, neurons associated with the ANS, and these neurons are responsible for things like, you've heard of fight or flight, mm -hmm. or rest and digest. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's interesting how many patients right that we see that have that are reporting gastrointestinal issues too, mm -hmm. um, changes in um, how they're they're processing food and, and how um, you know their their startle response yeah. is another one. Yeah. Um, and I should mention the neurons that are responsible for your ANS. Where are they? <laughs> right near your cervical spine. Yeah. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> so one last thing just with the autonomic nervous system that we want to go over is that the autonomic nervous system, that fight or flight and that rest and digest, it's kind of the underlying system between how our heart beats, how we breathe, the control of our vasculature. So many times I've heard a patient say, it feels like my head's blowing up like a balloon. It feels like there's a belt around my head and somebody keeps pulling it tighter, especially when I do physical exercise, or when I try to do a cognitive activity. And that's actually because if you have more of a, we see more of that fight or flight response in patients, um, it means that there's not good control over that blood pressure and you end up with what's called cerebral hypertension, literally more blood in your head. Um, so this isn't just a feeling, it's actually as a physiological source. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about the autonomic nervous system as it relates to brain function, but think about autonomic nervous system dysregulation like poisoning the well. It's going to cause everything else to be worse. And I don't know if we mentioned this before, but although both divisions are affected, the sympathetic system mm -hmm. is actually affected even more. That so. fight or flight That side. fight or flight, yeah. yep. Um, and, and it also increases irritability. You know, um, patients mm -hmm. are more prone to panic as well. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that is something that we're seeing a lot. Um, even in temperature. Yes, Isn't that's, that, yeah. A, yeah. So sometimes patients will report either flushing or they'll, they'll be cold and everybody else is yeah. warm Hot or vice flashes. versa. Yeah, yeah. Even, in, even in like 15 year old, mm -hmm. you know, males. <laughs> so there's, there's some very strange symptoms that can come from autonomic nervous system dysregulation. And it's not looked at enough, I feel like. Um, and we look at it and we'll, <laughs> we'll have that on another slide. Uh, but I think it's a very important puzzle piece um, to, to this kind of cryptic nature of these post-traumatic headaches. Okay, so when does a, a headache go from acute to chronic? Okay. Several studies show that um, headaches usually resolve in about three months. However, in 18 to about 65% of these cases, and we know that that's kind of a <laughs> it's very wide margin. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it may last longer um, and is then referred to as persistent PTH. And so it has to almost reach that three month mark before it's characterized mm -hmm. or classified so as PTH. Some, I've heard some clinicians say six months, some say a year. So I, I will say that one thing as we're going through these definitions is that there's a lot of, as you may have seen with these percentages, there, there aren't very clear-cut ends to some of these symptoms or, you know, when is persistent, when is chronic, etc. Mm -hmm. Which is very confusing for the patient because they keep asking, what do I do now? What point am I at, etc. Well, and it's confusing for us as clinicians too, you know, so it's almost like we just have to, we, we tend to set the three-month mark mm -hmm. because if they're struggling at three months, chances are they're struggling at six months. And again, the patient population we see is usually years out of their concussion. So that nomenclature doesn't really yeah. matter as mm -hmm. much because they're still struggling. Mm -hmm. um, severe head trauma, again, we stated this before, but just want to drive it home. Severe head trauma is, does, is not usually associated with these headaches uh, as much as these mild concussions are. And then I'm going to actually talk a bit about what the risk factors are for developing post-traumatic. Mm -hmm. So, some risk factors for uh, PTH in adults um, uh, are a bit clearer than they are for children. <laughs> so, for adults, um, so uh, there have been numerous studies done in the in the sports medicine world, um, and they suggest that these migraineous types of headaches are associated with not only cognitive impairment but also a longer protracted recovery. And so it's kind of that, that trifecta there. Mm -hmm. um, also in professional athletes, um, if you have had prior concussions, which I've yet to find an athlete that hasn't had prior concussions that we see, especially professional athletes, mm -hmm. but it's uh, risk factors are prior concussions, uh, how long you've been playing your sport, and 
actually if you have the APOE4 gene, and that gene is what's associated with Alzheimer's um, and cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. So a gene that not only impacts your brain, but also your body. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really interesting gene, um, but take away that if you have a predisposition genetically, you're much more likely uh, to develop these post-traumatic headaches, which you have no control over. So risk factors for post-traumatic headaches in children, again, like I said before, is a little, uh, a little bit muddier. Um, the factors are not consistent. Uh, what we have found was that uh, several studies show that female gender and being an adolescent uh, is a risk factor for developing PTH. However, repetitive head injuries did not affect the occurrence of it or the recovery of it. Um, but developmental disorders, um, psychiatric disorders, um, a history of headaches, migraines, family history of headaches or migraines mm -hmm. uh, can influence this, this recovery time. Yeah. One uh, other that kind of falls within that developmental is ADD or ADHD, mm -hmm. uh, which is really interesting. So there's, there's suggestions, suggestions, whether it be genetic or just physiologically related. Um, a lot of children with ADD or ADHD that get a head injury will then have these post-traumatic headaches, which is very unfortunate because they're already challenged with um, a learning disorder. Mm -hmm. So what are some common triggers? Uh, what can set these headaches off? Um, well, once a concussion occurs, you're dealing with a lot of patients that they don't want to physically exert or they don't want to cognitively exert because that can be a trigger. In fact, there's a study in 2017 that coined this term cognophobia, uh, which really explains this, this fear and this reluctance, almost just this avoidance of, of any type of screen time or, or overexertion physically for fear of, of what it does to their symptoms, mm -hmm. which is so difficult because the, the, the therapy, the rehabilitation, is actually pushing yourself in that way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's almost the exact opposite of what we want to do for our brains. Sleep deprivation is also a huge trigger, and it's this, this a cycle that just is just so negative feeds, and it feeds off each other. So when you're not getting enough sleep, you get a headache, but if you have headache pain, then you can't sleep and it just kind of goes back and forth. Um, changes in the environment, and we talked about this before, how that's so broad because that could be something as simple as barometric change in the atmosphere causing headaches, but it could also be something more significant like a change in a relationship, you know, an, an emotional change in the environment. Um, often our patients really struggle with maintaining their relationships with their partners, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it's very hard after a TBI and that emotional stress can trigger these headaches. And we can't forget diet, okay. Um, that's just a, li a little plug for, uh, for what we're going to be talking about in another few slides. Anything you want to add on this one? Um, no, not really. I just I was looking over that list and I kept thinking it's like the world is is against you. It's like <laughs> everything can induce a headache and we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but there is hope. I mean, you know, there may be that cognophobia, but as Dr. Fung's going to talk about, if you prepare the brain in the right, right way, you can get past these symptoms, etc. So, mm -hmm. it's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> I promise. Um, okay. So, on this next slide, um, we're talking about what some of the treatments are for PTH. What are some of the current treatments? So um, one of the most common, uh, unfortunately, now you hear my bias, is medications. And you can see here a, a slew of medications, NSAIDs, antidepressants, tryptans, uh, valproate, ergots, and, you know, um, uh, uh, barbiturates, mm -hmm. dopamax or topamax as well, you know, propanolols. Um, so there are so many medications that are used uh, to treat headaches, but I'll be honest, in most of our patients they're not effective, okay? Um, which brought to mind, as we were talking about this, I just had a consult with a patient earlier this week who sent me a list of her current medications, and I'm going to put them on the screen right now. I want to note that the ones that are asterisked are the ones that she's on right now and she actually just met with her physician two weeks ago and this is the whittled down list. Um, there are more medications that we just couldn't fit on here but she's tried almost everything but she's on all the asterisked medications and again um, 
I have every, I have all the respect for, for her, for her doctor, who I think is just trying the best he can to treat the symptom. Um, but we're missing the problem here. In fact, we're causing more problems because a lot of these medications have side effects or drug-to-drug -drug interactions that exacerbate or maybe even worse than the actual issue themselves. And so this, um, she's a 33-year-old female who's been struggling with this concussion for 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, and just seeing this medication list just makes it real that this is what's, what's happening. So, um, as I spoke of before on this next slide, we're talking about um, the mechanical force of the head and neck. So we can treat with medication, but it's also important to understand that there's a neuromuscular cervicogenic basis to this. And some of the treatment that we do for that is hands-on um, massage therapy, some craniosacral mm -hmm. uh, therapy as well. Mm -hmm. um, vestibular. Vestibular. Mm -hmm. um, our, you know, the way that we turn our head, the way that we control some of our eye movements, it's so related to our inner ear. Um, so that's one that you just can't forget about when you're looking to, to resolve the, that tension type headache. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, meditation, trying to relieve stress. You know, tension, reduce that stress, yes, reduce that, that, uh, uh, that ANS dysregulation. So could there be a connection between PTH and these other symptoms of, of concussion? Well, yes, the answer is yes. Um, and could this connection be a clue to us and to you on how to treat these other types of PTH? Spoiler alert, yes. Okay. Um, on this next slide, uh, there's a lot of words, so I just want to kind of break it down pretty, pretty simply. Um, this uh, flow chart uh, was taken from a paper that we published in 2017, uh, which actually uh, provided a theory to unify um, kind of different facets of what we believe is going on with post-concussion symptoms and why they get developed. And so, as we stated before, <clears throat> there's an autonomic nervous system pathway, as you can see here and then neurovascular coupling dysregulation. So as we stated before, the ANS is the body's regulatory system, right? Um, it sustains life, it sustains healthy bodily function, um, and, but neurovascular coupling is how the neurons and the vasculature, the blood supply, interact, okay? So this is very important because neurons need blood, because blood carries oxygen, glucose, and other energy metabolites that the neuron does not have on its own to fire. So the neuron needs to take that from a very healthy supply of blood in order to fire and maintain and sustain firing. Okay? So when that is disrupted, we can often get very similar symptoms associated with PC PCS, like fatigue, headache, mm -hmm. um, light noise sensitivity, you know, um, uh, brain fog. So it's almost like your brain is not getting the fuel that it needs to get from point A to point B. It's just sputtering, it's just, you know, puttering along <laughs> and, you know, very inefficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, but the big symptom here from both pathways is headache. Now. Dysfunction in, in either system, the ANS or the PCS, can cause headaches. But the thing with NVC, for, for example, there is a small part of your brain called the superior colliculus. Okay, very, very small. And that's a part of the brain that's responsible for visual tracking. So keeping your eyes working together, essentially, because we're binocular animals, we're predators. We need to make sure our eyes work together for a lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm. And if you're not getting enough blood to that superior colliculus, you can actually experience um, something similar, symptoms similar to ocular migraines. And so there's often been a misdiagnosis with these ocular migraines when truly it's just a blood flow problem to that superior colliculus. Yeah, yeah. So many times I've heard, heard patients, my eyes are pulling, my eyes are swollen, they're irritated, all of my pain is right here. <laughs> um, and it usually it's not an issue with actually the muscles of the eyes, it's an mm -hmm. issue with the brain. Oh, and how often do we see, do we hear patients say, no, I went to my eye doctor and I have 20-20 vision. Yes. <laughs> it's like, okay, we're it's not talking about your visual acuity, you know. Oh. <laughs> we're talking about the, the parts of your brain that control mm -hmm. vision and even ocular muscle movement. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay, and so talking about getting from point A to point B, I really love this, this slide uh, here because I think it really uh, graphically and pictorially explains 
how complicated this can be. So on the left hand side, um, this is like Google Maps, okay, we're looking at a very efficient brain that can get from point A to point B quickly, directly, efficiently. On the right hand side though, you see a brain that may have ANS issues, um, neurovascular coupling issues, and even though they're getting from point A to point B, they took the longest or most circuitous route possible, okay? So when you're doing that, you're expending more energy. You're not efficiently using that, that vascular supply of blood. And look at what it's costing you. So even though you can still go to work, get the job done, you're coming home and you're depleted. You're yelling at kids. You don't want to cook. You just want to go to sleep. Uh, and so this shows that um, just getting from point A to point B isn't enough. We got to figure out what it's costing you and we got to fix that problem. Um, this is uh, another slide that shows um, more clearly um, that all these different pathways that connect neuronal activity and blood flow. And you can see in the boxes in red, this is what a concussion can do to disrupt all of these intricate pathways. So it can cause axonal shearing. So axonal shearing, just to kind of make a definition, we've got these cells in our brain, those neurons, and they've got a body, and then they've got little dendrites or the little fingers that they use to communicate, and they've got a long axon that's like a rope. Now, oftentimes neurons will kind of signal together, they'll be kind of all those ropes are tied nicely, and with brain injury, you actually can get this shearing, or think about it like if you have some um, straw in your hands and you twist it. So the neurons aren't dead, but they're shearing of those connections, which can disrupt signaling. Um, and you can't see that on most scans. You have to do a very specific type of scan to see it that's not often done outside of research. Well, and all of these areas, inflammation, um, ANS dysfunction, damage to vasculature, dysregulation of MEC, these are not things that you typically see on regular imaging. Mm -hmm. And that's why it can be very frustrating for a lot of our patients that say, well, I've gotten all these scans done and it looks normal. I'm normal, but why do I feel so abnormal? These are things that happen on such a, a um, uh, Substructural level? Substructure, that's the, thank you for that word, word finding. <laughs> uh, substructural level that uh, without, of course, these um, maybe some uh, uh, higher grade research scans, um, you're not typically getting in a hospital or a clinic. Um, so we know where all, these dis where all the dysfunction can be and it can seem very complicated. But how do we find where exactly in the brain? Like, how did we know that that, su that superior colliculus was the culprit? Well, we use fMRI. fMRI is like Google Maps for the brain, okay? So if you see here on this slide, uh, on the top, you have a normal fMRI uh, with normal activation, and below, you see a patient with PCS. So you can clearly see that there are, uh, there's significantly reduced activation in areas that we know should be firing well. So. Uh, this allows us to target treatment. We can see exactly which areas are working well, which areas are not working well, which areas might be overcompensating or maybe even stealing blood away from other structures. And that really allows us to create this, this optimal window uh, where we can provide uh, the brain with ample blood flow and help that neuron, help these neurons learn how to sustain firing uh, over time again. Um, and that is done with a series of uh, cardiovascular reactivation, um, uh, cognitive therapies, and again, other types of, of occupational therapies, neuromuscular therapies, vestibular therapies. Um, the treatment that we do in our clinic um, is, is different in that we combine all of these different types of therapies into one week, um, and it's guided by fMRI pre and post. And so uh, we are able to really tailor and, and individualize these treatments for these patients. So uh, we are now on the fMRI targeted treatment can reduce PCS symptoms slide. You see a radar plot here. On the left hand side, uh, what we did was we actually took about 650 of our patients and they were administered a uh, self-report post-concussion symptom scale. Now this scale came up with <clears throat> an overarching score that looked at um, physical symptoms like headache, um, sleep issues, uh, emotional uh, uh, symptoms, and cognitive symptoms. On the right-hand side, you can see that uh, 
after a week, their symptoms had significantly reduced. So the, the, the closer you are to the middle, the, the less your score is and the more improved you are. Now again, um, headache is a part of this and as we know, headaches are associated with other PCS, with other PCS symptoms. But we wanted to, to, to see, well, what about just headache itself? Um, <clears throat> we took a, a small N of some of our patients in the last year or so, um, N of 13, seven males, six female. One of the males reported a pre-morbid migraine history, so a personal history of migraines. None of our patients were on migraine medications prior to coming to treatment. Um, about 85% of these patients had been struggling chronically with these post-traumatic headaches um, uh, before coming into treatment. After the one week of treatment, 55.5% uh, reported a significant improvement in the headaches in one week. And then when we followed them three to six months post, 63.6 reported long-term improvement in headaches uh, since treatment. But there was 36% of patients who were still struggling from the headaches, even after all of the treatment that we were able to provide, um, even though it was specific and targeted and we, tar we, we were able to help with the ANS and the NBC, there's something we're missing in over a third of these patients, which was concerning to us, okay? So why? And JC will cover that as a possible uh, explanation. So in summary, post-traumatic headaches are very complex, um, multifactorial as far as etiology. There are so many drugs that we find have so little effect uh, because they're really not treating the root of the problem. It's just symptom reduction. And again, a lot of these medications have interactions and side effects that are worse than the problem itself. Um, Treating neurovascular coupling and autonomic nervous system uh, dysregulation can treat PTH. And in our little sample study, you know, it can treat um, over about a third, uh, two thirds of the patients with PTH. But what about those non responders? And could diet be a possible solution? Um, we want to talk about ketogenics knowing that this may not be the end all be all. Um, the APOE4 gene is also a possibility, uh, but this is something that I think. Um, could be instituted and see if it could help. So I'm really excited to go over um, m basically migraine and the ketogenic diet. I'm going to cover some of the basics, so I apologize if some of the things I go over you know, but hopefully I'll also be able to provide some physiological mechanisms and some deeper understanding of what is migraine, you know, what are our theories behind it, you know, what is the ketogenic diet, what does it do to the body, and could it be effective for some types of migraine. So the first thing I want to cover is just, okay, let's imagine you've never heard the word migraine before. Let's say of those of us in the population that have never had a migraine before. What does it mean? What's the weight behind that word? So first of all, I want you to understand that migraine has a huge economic toll. 20 billion dollars in the US annually. This is time off of work, this is medical visits, this is those, some of those really expensive medications. Um, so this doesn't just affect the migraineurs, this affects their community. Um, and even in Canada, 500 million dollars uh, annually. So there's a lot of risk factors and a lot of comorbidities for migraine. Um, some of them are very similar to what Dr. Fong just discussed. Being female, having a history of brain injury, having a family history of migraine. Um, so some of these, some of these sources, you know, some people may just have migraines that develop on early in life, and we're actually going to discuss a case study like this later. Um, other patients, they were completely normal up until their motor vehicle accident, and suddenly they're having migraines. Um, treatment options are extremely limited and oftentimes we're kind of searching in the dark. I mean that patient with that list of medications, I felt like my heart stopped mm -hmm. when I saw that list and she still was experiencing these post-traumatic headaches. Um, they come with a lot of side effects that we won't go into very much. I could get on a soapbox about that. Um, and we don't really understand a lot about what these medications do, especially what they do in an injured brain where its function has changed. 
Um, the pathophysiology of migraine will walk through and some of the basic theories behind it, but I just want to state now that there's a lot of different players. Um, it's a very complex disease, and it's likely when we're asking who's the culprit, well, probably everyone. It's kind of the case with the body and the brain. It's, it's not just one, mm -hmm. it's everything. Mm -hmm. It's a system. It is. So to walk through kind of the timeline of a migraine, there's multiple stages. We have our prodrome phase. So this is prior to the actual headache itself. So many patients will have this foreboding feeling because they'll experience fatigue, nausea, changes in mood. Um, so there's actually a, a pre-migraine stage that happens. Next stage is aura. Not everybody experiences this. Uh, occurs in about 30% of people. And these are usually visual disturbances that patients will notice before the onset of the headache. Uh, it actually makes sense that most of them are visual. Anywhere between 50 and 80% of the synapses or the connections in our brain are involved in vision. So it makes sense that that would be this, the signal, ooh, something's functionally going on in my brain. Ah, okay, I'm having, I'm having visual disturbances like black spots mm -hmm. in my vision or bright lights, etc. So sometimes they can be really strange. They can be motor or uh, movement. They can be numbness, tingling, uh, changes in digestion. Interestingly enough, we just talked about mm -hmm. the autonomic nervous system. So usually a patient will have just one type, but sometimes they can have multiple or different ones. Then we get to the headache part that can last from four to 72 hours. Um, stabbing pain, unilateral, comes with a myriad of, of coincidental light sensitivity, noise sensitivity. You can feel like your brain is on fire. Then we get to the prostrome phase. So this is after the headache has stopped, but you're still experiencing some of these symptoms, mood changes, fatigue, etc. So despite the fact that the headache portion can last from 4 to 72 hours, I hope you appreciate how much time a patient spends in that timeline of migraine and how much time that takes away from their ability to live their life normally. On the next slide, we're going to walk through what causes migraine and I'm just going to start off with we have a lot of implications of neurovascular coupling and autonomic nervous system contributions. One of the oldest theories behind migraine is actually the blood vessels in the brain. So if you look at a brain when you're having a migraine you can actually see changes in blood flow, changes in the vessels of your brain. Um, Right at this point, research is more saying that those blood vessel changes aren't directly related to the pain. Um, we're going to talk about some possible sources of the pain, but there's definitely a blood contribution. Um, some people have more theorized that it's actually the neurons of your brain or the cells um, and that there be maybe changes in the way that those cells fire or they communicate to each other. It also makes sense that you could take, okay, just cells communicating to brain areas communicating, pathways between areas involved in vision, involved in mood regulation, so whole systems level change. Um, inflammation. So Dr. Fong would have gone a little bit through uh, inflammation and head injury. There's some suggestions that migraine also has an inflammatory um, you know, part to it. Finally, and this is something that, just to take a huge step back, we're talking about metabolism. We've talked about it a lot during this entire presentation, but one of the core features of migraine is dysregulated metabolism, how your brain eats, survives, and functions. Alrighty, so let's start off with the basics of the ketogenic diet. Um, this is, so I come from an epilepsy background, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, this you know, physiologically works and kind of how it is a medication. But to start off, the ketogenic diet at its very core is an equation. Fats, proteins, carbohydrates, high fat, low protein, low carbohydrate. That's the essence of it. It comes in a multiple um, variety, so some of them are more strict, some of them are less strict. Um, and the goal is to get yourself into a state of ketosis. So ketosis is very basically when you have more fats going around in the bloodstream being you know, broken down into ketone bodies, which are the core source kind of energetically. So the brain and the body can use glucose, but it can also use ketone bodies. And actually metabolically, you can get more ATP or more batteries out of a ketone body than you can from glucose. Um, we're gonna discuss that a, a little bit more detail later. 
But if you look on the graph on the right hand side, you'll notice this really nice curve and it talks about ketone bodies in the blood and reaching a state of nutritional ketosis, kind of that optimal range. Um, and so you do this through fasting, through that, that dietary you know, equation, but we want to remain within the safe zone and not go into that yellow or red, that ketoacidosis. I know that ketosis can kind of raise some hairs, especially for caregivers or nurses who go, wait, 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 wait the osis, like that's not a good thing. <laughs> we are talking about a physiologically normal state of ketones in the body, not to the dangerous state. Um, so to go through the, kind of the history of the ketogenic diet, it was developed a little over 100 years ago, uh, and it was developed for epilepsy. So um, there were children, and there still are children, that don't respond to epilepsy medications and that still have seizures. It was discovered that a dietary intervention of, intervention of high amounts of fats can actually treat these patients so that they don't have seizures anymore. It's not very commonly used, and I'm going to walk you through what it looks like, uh, but very basically this gave us a clue that diet could affect the brain in a beneficial way. Well, and 100 years ago, we didn't have the medications that we have. We had like two. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Versus. So, and, and I mean, the, the amount of effect that it had on these patients was, for the time, mm -hmm. remarkable. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's still used, by the way. Um, again, not yes. common. There are implications for cardiovascular and you know, internal organ health, but it is effective. Um, what was really cool is the ketogenic diet has also been investigated for other neurological diseases like Alzheimer's, motor neuron diseases. Um, so there's a lot of evidence accumulating that this may be a, a key to unlocking some healing just from changing the way you eat. So to go into the classic ketogenic diet, um, you're going to look at this graph on the right hand side and go, that's a lot of dark blue. That's <laughs> fats. That's how much fats you have to consume in the ketogenic diet. So calorie rise, that's a huge piece of that equation. Um, only 2% of the diet or your calories are from carbohydrates. Like Alina and I were just talking about, that could be a cracker depending on your BMI. That could be a half of an apple. Um, so this is a very strict diet and not many people take it on. Uh, it also has really limited adherence or compliance. It's hard to stick with this diet. Only about 40% of people can. Uh, and it makes sense why. I actually think that's quite high. <laughs> because usually it's pediatric I, it's where pediatrics. the parents the parents are mm -hmm. dictating, here's what you're going to eat. Yeah. Um, honestly, I'd break this diet in a hot second. <laughs> <laughs> and it might sound fun to eat bacon all day, every day, but I think it gets old after a while. Mm -hmm. Your choices are very limited. Mm -hmm. I mean, even think about something like butter and an avocado, there's still carbohydrates that you so need to are count. out. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah you, can't, you can't eat those. Yep. Yep, no avocado toast. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> the next one I want to talk about is the low glycemic index treatment. So you'll notice on the right hand side that we're, we're, we've changed that pie and we've got a lot less fats and a lot more protein. Still limited carbohydrates, but it's not as strict as the classic. Uh, this is generally has higher adherence. It's easier for people to start in on this low glycemic index treatment. One of the core pieces is it talks about not just what you're eating, but how much does that food, food raise your blood glucose and how do interactions between foods, uh, you know, regulate and you know, cause increases in glucose, etc. So there's a lot more math involved in this, um, but it's easier to, you know, it's easier to stick with it, gonna be honest, because of that more less rigorous equation. Mm -hmm. um, and so with this diet, it's also easier to look up recipes, you know, to, to have more variety in your food. So a lot of people actually do like this diet. Um, a lot of nutritionists as well. The next one I want to talk about is the NCT diet, or the medium chain triglyceride uh, diet. See that five times fast. <laughs> so this is also another more relaxed form, and it really focuses on MCTs, which are a specific type of fatty acid. Um, you can get them in coconut oil, you can get them in a lot of different healthy foods. Some people suggest that it's easier to get into ketosis if you primarily consume these types of fats. Well, and a as we're going through these uh these variations of KD, mm -hmm. uh, it's almost in order of uh, more accessibility. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when you went to Whole Foods and you got uh, 
the MCT ginger drink. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, to tell a little bit of a story, um, all of us, well, before COVID, all of us <laughs> went to the store sometimes just going in, I'm starving, I haven't had you know dinner yet, I just need to grab food, I'm thirsty, and I love ginger. Um, so I was in the drink aisle and I see this little tiny bottle that has ginger on it, and I'm just running through, I want to get home and make dinner. So I grab it, and I'm in the car, I open it up, and I'm expecting it to be like puree ginger with maybe some honey and some lemon because those were listed on the ingredients but I forgot the big one which was MCT diet approved <laughs> it was healthy fats so it, it tasted just fine but it's a bit of a surprise drinking it and going that was not what I expected but it's so accessible it's so accessible it's, it's easier to do and so um, as we go through this, the next one as well, I think will sound very familiar to you all, and you could go to your local Walmart as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so having said that, Atkins. So there is a lot of history with the Atkins diet and possibly some very unhealthy versions, cardiovascular issues, etc. But the modified Atkins diet has really more focused on healthy fats, balance, etc. Um, and it's a very widely known and very accessible diet. Very I mean, accessible. We have an image here of a boxed meal that says, you know, carb friendly, etc. Looks pretty good to me. <laughs> um, so adherence and compliance is pretty high. Uh, so according to a paper that came out in two, uh, 2015, it's around 56% of people can stick with this diet. Mm -hmm. um, so overall, we've just summarized a range of different types of the ketogenic diet, but it is it can be a spectrum. Like some people won't stick with one type of diet. Some people will supplement, you know, with exercise or just fasting. So don't consider these to be the only ones out there. Now, finally, I want to step back and consider what, what do you have to think about when you're stepping into this realm of ketogenic diet? Well, first of all, if you're changing your diet, you need to make sure that if you're eating less carbs, which are fruits and veggies, that you're still getting the right amounts of vitamin E, of vitamin C, of magnesium, of iron. So some people, especially if they're on the more strict versions, will need to take supplements. Um, if you have a lot of fats and proteins in your body, it can affect your kidneys. Make sure that you're getting mm -hmm. enough water. Um, also, just making sure that you're constantly assessing mm -hmm. how do I feel, you know, how am I doing on this diet, should I modify it for my lifestyle, etc. And it's not good for everybody. There are some other conditions, mm -hmm. kidney disease, heart disease, heart disease, <laughs> where you may not be able to go on the ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. We also don't know what it you know, it does, for example, in pregnancy. Um, so just take it with a grain of salt. You know, this is not the perfect diet for everybody. All right, let's talk a little bit of some other options. So um, with the ketogenic diet, you can actually increase the level of ketone bodies in your system just by fasting because your body will start breaking down fats that you already have. Um, also, there have been salts um, and supplements like that ketogenic BDM trained diglyceride shot <laughs> that you can find widely available. Um, overall, I think many people use a combination of these. Don't just rely on the diet itself, um, just for ease, basically. Now let's talk about testing and timeline of ketosis. So you don't just in one day go into ketosis. It takes sustained you know, application of the diet or the fasting or the salts, etc. cetera. Um, and it requires upkeep. I mean, you gotta make sure that you're actually in ketosis. Mm -hmm. You know, you could, you could have a system that it's just harder to get into that state. So it's always good to get some kind of testing done. The, mo the best ones are usually blood testing um, or the in-clinic testing. The breath and the urine ones aren't as consistent, gonna be honest, so I wouldn't trust them as much. Um, another thing to consider as you're going through this ketogenic diet is just the physical signs. Many of you have probably heard of, not COVID, but the <laughs> keto flu, which they're not similar at all. Uh, and to those dealing with COVID right now, our hearts reach out to you. Hopefully that joke was a little bit funny. <laughs> but you can have headache, you can have fatigue, especially during that first period when you're trying to metabolically reteach your system how to consume energy. Um, it can be pretty nasty. Some of them can end up with stomach upset. Some of them you can end up with increased thirst, muscle fatigue. Usually these will resolve, um, especially as you st start adjusting lifestyle. And some people will notice good weight loss and cognitive effects. Overall, please consider a timeline. 
of assessing the risks, of you know talking to a medical practitioner, um, you know keeping an idea of okay what are my side effects. It takes constant upkeep, just like taking a medication. All right. Yeah. So, so with all of that, <laughs> all of that. <laughs> can can the keto diet? win against a migraine. Yeah. Is it effective? Is this something that we should be considering for these patients that persist with these symptoms? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there was a case study that came out a couple years ago, and this actually, this case study was written by an MD whose wife started having migraines in elementary school um, and wasn't diagnosed with migraine until she was in her teens. She actually went on the ketogenic diet not for headaches, but for weight loss. Um, started consuming high fat shakes, etc., and noticed a reduction in her symptoms, and eventually she had no symptoms at all. So this is pretty amazing, especially when you consider that even when she went off of the diet after a few months, her headaches didn't come back, at least in, you know, at the point where her husband wrote this article. So there definitely are physiological and case study examples of this may be effective for some people. One thing I, I do need to say, just from a research point of view, is that we don't have a lot of good uh, controlled research studies. And that makes sense because everybody's doing this in their own home. Mm -hmm. It's not like we can abduct somebody, put them in a hospital, control their diet for six months. So, you know, this is another consideration that this may not work for everyone, but it may work for some people. But the reason why we were asked to speak on this, because actually this is a modified talk from one that we gave last year sometime, sometime. <laughs> uh, and uh, there's just been so much interest in ketogenics mm -hmm. and what that can possibly do to alleviate symptoms not just of, of, um, uh, of migraines or epilepsy but mm -hmm. post-concussion yeah. uh, symptoms yeah. and so I think it's really something that we need to understand better um, but what we want to do is just show you that there are absolute benefits to this, mm -hmm. but they aren't for everybody. Uh, but most of the research right now is still limited. Yeah, yeah. And just to kind of discuss on the more scientific side, I mean, we've, we keep bringing up these keywords like inflammation, neuronal signaling. Ketone bodies in the system and in the blood can actually reduce inflammation. They can, you know, decrease excitation or overactivation of the brain that's common in migraine. Uh, they can improve, you know, the response of the vasculature. So a lot of the um, a lot of the things that those ketones bodies do, and being in a state of ketosis basically targets a lot of mechanisms of migraine. So it makes mm -hmm. sense that we've kind of delving now into, okay, let's figure out how it works and when it can work. To summarize a ketogenic diet, there are some pros and there are some cons. You know, okay, very adaptable. You can do it in your own home. I don't have to keep going to my doctor and going, do I need to increase my medication or decrease? There's, but there is limited adherence and there is sometimes confusion of what type of the ketogenic diet is good for me. So we're just gonna summarize the ketogenic diet. What are some of the pros? Well, you can adapt it to your lifestyle and to socioeconomics, but... <laughs> Limited adherence. I and JC would not be able to stick to this for mm -mm. one minute. No, nope, I like my apples way too much. <laughs> and in that study by, by Yi, um, Yi mm -hmm. uh, et al., about 2015, we're not the only ones. There's very, very limited adherence, and of course, the the one that is that is uh, uh, had the highest adherence was the modified Atkins. But it's because of ready availability of food. Mm -hmm. um, again, um, in children, it's a little bit better. In adults, it's a little harder. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that does lead us to talk of increased interest. I mean, there's a reason we're giving this talk. Mm -hmm. There's cookbooks available, you know, there's online recipes. So there's kind of this buzz in the air about the ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. um, but that's very much contrasted to what Alina's going to talk about is implementability. Yeah, just low implementability. It's yeah. just, it's difficult. It's difficult to, to follow it. It's difficult to find um, uh, the foods. I mean, if you are on the original ketogenic diet, um, it's also quite expensive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Lasting effects. I mean, this is kind of the, the golden egg that we're trying to talk about is, for some people, this could be the fix. Um, but that's also contrasted with what happens if you're on the ketogenic diet, and it's working well, but yeah. what happens if you go off? Exactly, it, it's not uh, studied to be a long-term treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, once you 
get off the diet, and as most diets do, <laughs> right? We're on it, we're off, we're on or off it. Um, if you're not adhering to the diet, it's not a long-term solution. Mm -hmm. Some people don't use it just for migraine. It can also be for weight loss. Um, you know, some people could find that they, you know, okay, I have a migraine. I need to lose a little bit of weight. Beautiful. It's it's the answer to everything. This really is a community effort. Mm -hmm. um, so don't don't think you have to go at it alone. And it's not easy. Um, so don't feel bad if you fail a couple times. Mm -hmm. You know, um, this uh, it. There are so many pros and cons as we've listed here. Uh, in and there's the even summary. more. I mean, this uh, is yes. very, very bare bones. Mm -hmm. um, but for those of you who have tried everything else and haven't tried this, it might be worth a try. I think the biggest piece here is that there are treatments for post-traumatic headache that aren't pharmacological, that are safer, that are proven. But also food could be a medicine. Mm -hmm. Food could be a type of therapy. Um, and I think this goes even past the ketogenic diet itself. I think that we're now understanding from studies on the microbiome, on genetics, that the right types of foods may allow you to heal faster or heal com completely. Well, and there are even foods um, that we talk to our patients about that are foods that are linked with inflammation, mm -hmm. foods that are linked with non with, with, uh, with less inflammation. Um, sometimes foods are called nightshades as well, you know, mm -hmm. so there's certain vegetables that I love eating that I was really sad to find out are linked to inflammation. <laughs> um, and again, we're not saying that you need to cut all these things out, but I mm -hmm. think as a whole, we need to just be much more aware of this mind, body, gut connection. Mm -hmm. And um, when you ingest something into your body, whether it's a prescription drug, whether it's food, whether it's Diet Coke, um, it's affecting multiple systems. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we enjoyed this time together. <laughs> Stay safe. Wash your hands. Some Purell. Um, we'll get through this together. Yes. Thank you for the opportunity. And um, again, hope you're warm in Arizona. <laughs>